So welcome to another edition of Paul's Letter to the Galatians. This is going to be episode 14. And the title of this today's message is Believing is All You Need to Be Right. So let's jump on in and let's read the scripture verse. I put last week's verse as a, just to keep context in, today's key verse is going to be verse 6, but I'm going to read verse 5 to give us context about today's message. He therefore that ministereth to you the Spirit, and worketh miracles among you, doeth he it by the works of the law or by the hearing of faith. Paul was saying here is the miracles that are being done, the ministering of the Spirit, the pouring out of the Spirit that happened um, through the baptism of the Holy Spirit, evidence and speaking in tongues, did that, and the miracles, the subsequent miracles that were being manifested in the church in Galatia at the time. Because remember, when they went under the law, the Christ was no longer of any effect. Did he, did he do it by the works of the law? Did he do it by uh, self-righteousness, self-effort, or by the hearing of faith? Did it because you heard and you believed? Or was it because you worked hard to get something from God, to cause God to move? And I want to take this opportunity because to pause here before we I jump into the next verse to say, Paul was saying in essence and something that today in the church that we do struggle with. And it is this, at what point does me working, at, at what point does ministering, right? If you're in the, if you're in the, in the if you're a, 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 um, a pastor, a teacher, an usher, a deacon, whatever it is, if you're in ministry of some sort, capacity, if you're serving, if you're greeting, at what point does service f- start falling into the land of works? That's very important because that's something that I had struggled with for many years in terms of, you know, there are things, and this is why you have to know your Bible, because there are things that are within our control and there are things that are outside of our control. And I think it's very important for us to realize what, where is that, where are those boundaries, right? Where are those borders? We get into trouble because we, we transgress those borders. We go past those borders. We go beyond a point, okay? So at what point does service become something that undoes, I know that's not a word, undoes or uh, the cross? At what point do, does my service, at what point does my zeal, right, to please God, put me into the realm of Galatians 5.4? Christ is of no effect unto you, whosoever you are justified by the law, you have fallen from grace. At what point? And I think it's very important for us to know that, to know at what point do I sort of drift from having a desire to, to do the right. See, there's a difference between a desire to please God, because there is a point of scripture says, because we do those things that are pleasing in his sight. But then all of a sudden, I think the church kind of takes this massive approach that service to God and showing up and working hard and working a 40 or 50 hour a week job and then going to work, at, uh, going to the church at night and doing VBS and doing this and doing that to the neglect of your own health is somehow pleasing to God. And it is not. It is not. There, there's a very fine line between service and service to the Lord, service in some ministerial capacity or that you've been asked to serve, right, by your leaders and 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 the works of the law. The underlying thing is, why am I doing this? So I want you to think about that. Why am I doing this? Why am I serving? If you're a a preacher, why am I preaching? Why am I, you know, uh, say, uh, broadcasting my messages? Why am I doing that? What's the purpose of it? Is it to gain more followers on Instagram or Facebook? Is it to gain more followers on YouTube, more likes? Am I up when people tune in? Am I down when people don't tune in? Am I up when the church seats are filled? And am I down when there's no one in there but me preaching? I mean, that's a real gut check. Why am I doing this? Am I doing this to be obedient because God has called me to preach and to teach? You know, if Paul... Let's take Paul. Paul's an excellent example of the point I'm trying to make here. If Paul would have went by the number of people who responded to his preaching, 
in the beginning of his ministry, if he would have responded to that, if he would have went off of the number of trials and tribulations, the stonings, the jailings, the shipwreck, if he would have went based on that, and by today's definition of success, Christian success, he would have been a total failure, a complete failure. The largest church of the New Testament, which was Ephesus, when he started out there, nobody wanted to hear from him. Nobody was interested in him, right? If there would have been Facebook back then or Instagram, no one would have tuned in. No one would have showed up. But that did not deter him because he knew he was on a mission and he knew he had been called by God. So you have to ask yourself. And I would say that whether you're a pastor, a lay person who's been asked to serve, you know, sometimes... We feel pressure because if the pastor asks us to do something in church and we don't and we feel guilty if we don't do it because somehow we equate the pastor to God. He is not he or she is not God. They are ministers. They've been called to minister. Know what I'm saying? Listen, the job of a pastor is to discern your giftings. The purpose of a church is to edify you, to build you up to instruct you so that you can find your place in, in, in the kingdom and find your ministry. That's my job as a pastor is to help you find out what you've been called to do. And oftentimes as a pastor, you get into a discernment, you get a glimpse into the future of that person, you get a glimpse into the calling of that person, but that person is not yet ready for that. And that's what requires patience and waiting on the Lord because timing is everything. So there is a difference as a pastor if, uh, you know, uh, one of my ushers or, or my greeters, we don't, uh, usher sounds more like a, like a movie theater, somebody sits you down, but a greeter, someone who greets you, someone who's spiritually sensitive and spiritually mature, at least in this ministry, in this church, right? You're not going to be greeting anybody if your house is a wreck, if you're having problems and issues and if there's any spiritual immaturity. Because a greeter has to be prepared that, be able to discern as that person walks through the door, the, their spiritual temperature. I mean, they might be down, they might, and just, you know, a, a, a word fitly spoken, the proverb says, is like apples of gold in settings of silver. Man, it is just something that just refreshes the soul. So you can't just have somebody at that door who's just going to park somebody in a seat. At least not here. We don't do that like that. But let's say, for example, one of my greeters is uh, on vacation or, uh, you know, not, didn't show up. They call me, Pastor, I, we can't make it. We have this thing, you know, uh, maybe it's a family emergency, right? They have to go, go see a, a relative or something like that. Okay, so then now we're, I'm, I'm down a greeter, or maybe because here in this, in this ministry, we, you know, husband and wife greet together. We don't believe that people are like, okay, uh, you know, you're called to this and your wife's called to that or you're called to this and your husband's called to that and the two of you are like kind of like here. That doesn't mean because the scripture says that the two shall become one. So if you're married, your ministries and your callings are interwined. It doesn't mean it's going to be the same thing, but there's going to be a crossover of the two. There's going to be something that's going to be a commonality between the two of you. So um, when we prepare couples for ministry, um, you know, we, we first we look at their marriage and the state of their marriage, right? Just like the scripture says, right? Their ability to communicate and how do they cohabit with each other? If they have children, how do they uh, rule their homes and how do they, their children behave and all that? Because that's all a reflection of you, right? Of your marriage, which falls squarely on the husband's lap. Sorry, guys. I didn't say that. The Lord does. So anyway, um, so that Sunday morning, there's, we're short greeters, and I, I, I or myself, my wife, Pastor Sharon, approaches someone and says, listen, uh, so-and-so, they called out, um, we'd like for you to, you know, to step in and to greet. Now, I got to tell you that we don't do things arbitrarily around here. We don't just grab somebody because they're the first person through the door. We look at people, we, we look at them, and we, we pray, and we have a sensitivity. We feel like, you know, they're... they're, they're you know, ready for that responsibility. And we asked them to, okay? And they're like, you know, okay, pastor, whatever. Now, it's, say, say it happens that there's some kind of a, an extended thing or, or whatever where they may have to do that for several Sundays and we would ask them, are you okay? Because we don't put pressure on anybody. Look, all I can do is identify your giftings, 
prepare you and equip you for that, for that, for that ministry in which those giftings are going to be used. But ultimately, it's your decision whether you want to walk down that path. We don't force anybody. And we don't also say, well, you know what, we're never going to ask that person again. Because I know in some churches, the mentality is, if I ask you once or twice and you don't, and you don't bite, I'm never going to ask you again. We don't do that here. Because sometimes people are just not ready. Sometimes people just don't have that, that spiritual maturity yet to discern these things. Which goes to this thing of the law. The law makes sure makes you myopic. You can't really see life for what it is. You can't really take into account and weigh the difficulties and the trials and the tribulations and the storms that you're going through and say to yourself, well, why is this happening? I don't see any good coming of all of this, Lord. But the Word says all things work together for good to those who love God and those that are called according to His purpose. For those whom He foreknew, He did predestine to be conformed into the image of His Son. Everything's a test. Unfortunately, we don't always pass our test and we cannot even discern that we're going through a testing. So there's difficulties and there's, there's, there's stuff that people go through and they just can't handle it, right? They just, it's just too much. They don't see the purpose in it. And part of today is to help you hopefully start on a path to be able to face your trials and your storms with a little bit more dignity and respect and honor to the one who died on the cross for you, Okay. So the works of the law is trying to do something to please God. So then the question becomes this. The person that I asked to step in, are they, they stepping in probably because the, I asked them as the senior pastor and they'll, they'll do that. But at some point, if they're doing a good job and things are going well and for whatever reason that other couple can't come back or there's some other issues or whatever that's going on, then the question becomes if their giftings and the talents are there, do you want to want to continue doing that? And I know that probably blow your mind because that doesn't happen, at least in the 40 some odd years I was in the church. I've never seen that. And my wonderful wife's been in the born and raised in the church and see never seen it either. No one ever asks you, are you okay with doing this? But I will tell you that if you are manning a camera and your heart's desire is to teach children and you have giftings for it and nobody's called you and nobody's prepared you for that, that pastor is going to get an F and the F column when it concerns you. Because our job is to discern the giftings. Now, you can, which leads to this, because you're saying, well, why are we talking about all this? Well, so you can have giftings, but then what's your motivation to use those giftings? That's how you know if it's the works of the law or am I doing it by the hearing of faith? Because the, our key verse today is verse 6. Even as Abraham believed God and it was accounted to him for righteousness. Now, let's look at what does believe mean. It means to have faith in, upon, or with respect to a person or thing. For example, credit, by implication, to entrust. And here's the beautiful one. Especially one's spiritual well-being to Christ. Abraham believed God. Abraham did not look at his circumstances and the things that he was going through. The, neither, neither the deadness of Sarah's womb, because today it literally, uh, Pastor Sharon once mentioned that to me, it literally means like a hysterectomy. Impossible for her to bear children. He was dead too in his body. That means the plumbing wasn't working. Yet, it did not stop him from believing and trusting God to have faith in you know why he was able to do that? Because I believe Abraham was able to look back at his life and remember the calling that he had in Ur of the Chaldees. And every step of the way, God was with him. Abraham knew something that we often forget is that God is consistent in his dealings with us. His character is consistent. If he was good yesterday, you better believe he'll be good today and he'll be good tomorrow. Because God is, it's impossible for God to lie. He cannot lie. Not that he doesn't choose. It's impossible for God to lie. And God's character is like the Mount Zion. It can't be moved. But our, our belief in God and our trust in God fluctuates based upon whatever the current storm is that we're going through. So believed. So God, he, he entrusted himself, his well-being to Christ. 
because the angel the, that appeared to him, the three angels, one of them was the pre-incarnate Christ. So he entrusted God. God came, hey, I'm going to come back in a year and Sarah's going to have a child. That, that's the context of it. Even as Abraham believed God and it was accounted unto him for righteousness. Now, let's look at what does that mean, accounted, right? It means to take an inventory. For example, estimate, right? So what it means is that it, it, it was taken inventory and it was accounted to him for righteousness. And let's look before I expound further on accounted. Righteousness means equity of character or act, especially Christian justification. So what does that mean? Abraham <clears throat> had faith and entrusted God to keep his word and his promises. And that act of belief, it made inventory. In the inventory column to him, it was accounted to him as equity of character and justification with God. So what does that mean for you and I? What that means for you and I is this, is that when we believe God, when we trust God in spite of our circumstances, in spite of the situations, in spite of the medical reports, in spite of how much money you may or may not have in the bank, in spite of the bills, in spite of the looming possibility that you may lose your job or you lose your house or whatever, in spite of that, you believe God. Just like Paul did on that ship in the middle of a storm where he told that those people in the storm, he says, Wherefore, sirs, be of good cheer, for I believe God, and it shall be even as it was told unto me. I believe God. Get that wired into your thinking. I believe God. No matter what circumstances you're going through, I believe God. I believe God. I believe God, and that it shall be even as it was told unto me. Even as the scripture says, it shall be unto me. Because the Bible says we're supposed to flee from youthful lust, but we're not supposed to run from the devil. It says, stand, and having done all, stand. With your loins girt about with truth, wearing the breastplate of righteousness, your feet shod with the stability of the gospel of peace, and above all, taking the helmet of salvation, the shield of faith, and the sword of the Spirit, which is the Word of God. We're supposed to stand our ground. Most of us are running for our lives when no one's pursuing us. The scripture says the wicked flee when no one pursue it, but the righteous are as bold as a lion. You want me to tell you why you run if you're running? Because you don't believe that you're righteous. You don't believe that you completely, that blood that spilt on that day, on that Friday afternoon, that blood that when he rose from the dead, he went into the Holy of Holies in heaven and put his own, sprinkled his own blood on that mercy seat and sat down. You don't believe that that was enough for you. You don't believe that that was enough to solve whatever problems you're going through, whatever medical issues you're facing, whatever fam familial issues you're facing, whatever dark clouds that are gathering around you. You don't believe that blood is enough to keep you. So you run. I'm here to tell you as someone who has run for a good part of his life until he came after me, there's no need to run. God really is as good as He says He is. He is as good as He says He is, and you can trust Him. But I want to take a closer look at faith. Let's look at faith, right? Because that's a word that gets thrown around a lot in the church, right? Faith. You've got to have faith. Well, what does that mean? We talked a little bit about that last week. It means persuasion. What are you persuaded of today? Are you more persuaded of the bills that you're going to have to pay tomorrow? come Monday? Are you more persuaded of the, the difficulties maybe in your commute to go to work? Are you dreading tomorrow because tomorrow's Monday? Oh my God, I have to start another work week. What are you persuaded about? Because your persuasion is going to move your character and it's going to move your emotions and it's going to move your body in the wrong direction. Your health is going to deteriorate. And we've talked about this. If you've been following this ministry for any length of time, you'll know that stress produces unhealthy things in us, right? Credence and moral conviction of religious truth of the truthfulness of God, especially reliance upon Christ for salvation. And that's not salvation like getting saved for the first time, but rather deliverance from evil, from difficulties. David said, Yea, though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil, for thou art with me. Thy rod and thy staff, they comfort me. This is a man who lived under the law. But he knew the character of God. We seldom forget it. You want to know the character of God, look to that cross. That's how much you're loved. And constancy in that profession. 
many of us, what we confess is our problems, never our solution. Many of us confess what's wrong in our lives instead of what's right. And you can say, well, pastor, there's nothing right in my life. Everything's a disaster. My marriage is a disaster. My, my finances are... Yeah, but you know what? You're not a disaster. Because Christ in you is the hope of glory. If, in fact, you're saved. If you're saved and you belong to God, then I'm here to tell you, my brother, my sister, you have an anchor that holds beyond the veil. That cannot be moved. All you have to do there is stand. Stand. And having done all to stand. So, you know something? Many, the world asks, why am I here, right? Everybody's here to carve their name into, uh, into history, to make a mark on history. But as a Christian, you know, we need to ask, why am I here? What's the purpose of me being here? Because honestly, some of us don't really know why we're here. We're saved and we're like, okay, I guess I'll do whatever the pastor tells me to do. I don't see any giftings. I don't see any future. Well, I'm sorry to say that that, that is a shame because the job of a leader is to help you develop your gifts so that you can launch your ministry. You're here for me to lift you up. You're not here to lift me up in the sense of worshiping me and doing things for me and whatever. No, no, I'm here to serve you. That's what a pastor is, to serve, to wait on tables, to feed you, to instruct you, to guide you, to open doors for you, to launch out into what God has prepared for you. So let's, why am I here? That's a great question. You know what, Lord, why am I here? If you're going through tremendous difficulty and trials and medical challenges and people in your family and issues and sicknesses, and like, why is this happening? Why am I here? What's my purpose? And you know what, some of us, even will think, well, this is all I'm good for. I'm only here to be a slave. I'm only here to be a donkey. I'm only here to take other people's load and carry other people's load, and nobody's here to carry my load. No, that's not what the Bible says. That's how you may feel, and your circumstances may be that way. But you need to know, why am I here? And I search for some key scriptures that I hope will help you see why you're here. We are his workmanship, created in Christ Jesus for good works, which God prepared beforehand that we should walk in them. Ephesians 2.10 You see, you're not here to serve me. You're not here to, to do my bidding, as it were, right? You're here, you are his workmanship, created in Christ Jesus for good works. But here's the thing. My job as a pastor, is to help you discover what are those good works which God prepared beforehand for you. What are they? Because I, I'm, if you have a tender heart and you have a servant's heart and you want to serve people, people will take advantage of you. 100%. And boundaries become super important for you to have. Absolutely. So what are those good works? Because there are works that are good that God foreordained beforehand for us to do. But there are other works that are just the works of the law and they're meaningless and they're wood, hay and stubble and we'll get no reward for it. They'll get consumed in fire. So we need that spiritual discernment to understand what are these works that God has prepared beforehand for me. Secondly, in him we have an inheritance. You may only have, you may be broke in the natural, but in the spirit, you're incredibly wealthy. Having been predestined according to the purpose of him who works all things according to the counsel of his will. God has a plan specifically for you, and you are the only one that can mess those plans up. You're the only one that can that can not slow down, impede those plans. But if you yield to the Lord, if you yield to the Holy Spirit, if you have an open heart that says, Lord, I don't understand why I'm going through these things, but I want to be obedient to you. I want to surrender to you. I want you to give me the grace and the strength because if you're allowing these things to happen to me, help me. I'm coming to you for strength because you said, you told Paul, my grace is made perfect in weakness. I am weak in this area, Lord. Let you be strong and help me through this area. That's the right attitude because Sometimes we go through things on purpose so that we can get to that point where we just say, okay, Lord, I, I give up. I surrender. I, I give it to you. 
And this is one of, one, of my, one of my favorite verses here. But you are a chosen race. You're not a mistake. Maybe, you know what, you may say, you know, my parents, uh, they had premarital sex and I got, my mother got pregnant. My, my father left. He never married my mother and my mother raised me by myself. I was a mistake. Let me tell you something. You are never a mistake. God formed you in your mother's womb. God had a plan and a purpose before the foundations of the world for you. Don't ever let anybody say that you're a mistake. That you were an afterthought. No, you were in the mind and in the heart of God from the very foundations of the world. That's why you are a chosen race, a royal priesthood. That means you're a king priest. And you know what? Your circumstances may be so lined up like that. They may look terrible. I mean, you don't only think, the only thing you run is your mouth because there's nobody else to lead. There's nothing to do. I don't know what I'm doing here. But before God, you're a king and a priest. And one day when the Lord comes for his church and we are in heaven, you will see yourself the way he has seen you. My job is to try to help you to see yourself now as that so that when you stand in his presence, you get a tremendous amount of reward. Because let me tell you something. On that day when we're perfect, we'll know all things even as we have known, Paul said. But to believe God now in the flesh when all of the circumstances tell you otherwise, when everything else tells you that you're out of your mind to believe that God is going to do that for you, that is pleasing to God. You know, one of the things that every time I read in Hebrews 11, I get to that point in scriptures and I cry. And it says, and the world was not worthy of them. And God was not ashamed to be called their God. Because they believed, even though they didn't see anything, even though there was no tangible evidence, no hope in the natural that anything of what they were believing of was going to happen. Yet they still believed. They went to their graves believing for a Messiah that you and I have gotten to enjoy the fruits of it, and they never did. But yet they never stopped believing. That you may proclaim the excellence of him who called you out of darkness into his marvelous light. We are supposed to be the light of the world. Not hiding in our homes and hiding our faith. But we should... Yeah, dare I say, bear it proudly with humility and meekness like Jesus. You know, we're always going to find storms in our lives. There's always going to be storms and they're going to be nasty. And that is the way of the disciple. It is what life is. I don't know what anyone's told you about how the Christian life should be, but I'm telling you the Word of God talks about it. Difficulties, storms, tribulations. But be of good cheer. God will always open a door for you no matter what it is, if you have the patience to wait and to listen. No temptation has overtaken you. Now, that word temptation means testing, right? It also means testing. So no testing, no temptation has overtaken you that is not common to men, to man. God is faithful and he will let you be tempted. He will not let you be tempted beyond your ability. But with the temptation, he will also provide the way of escape that you may be able to endure it. And you may say, well, I'm going through a very difficult time and I don't see a doorway. I promise you, there's a doorway. You just need to take a step back and listen. So you know what? As we get ready to close, it's time to ask yourself this question. Am I trying to work hard at pleasing Him? Am I trying to do things because I feel guilty? Because I've been led to believe that I have to work hard to please Him? That I have to work and work like a slave? Or am I resting in his finished work? Am I accepting that it is finished? No matter what the storm is in life, if you look at Golgotha and you see that finished work of what Christ did for you, and let that be the light that helps you, guide you out of your storm, you'll get to the other side. And remember this, the gospel equals Jesus plus nothing. Christ revealed in me, that's the goal. The goal for which we strive for. So my friends, until um, we meet again for our next broadcast, um, we will not be broadcasting next week. As you know, at the end of the month is the time when Pastor Sharon and I take for ourselves. But we'll see you in two weeks. And um, until then, God bless you, and I hope you were encouraged by this message.